Welcome everyone to this fabulous panel where we are going to be discussing the Black experience in the American theater, exploring our journey. And so I want to go ahead and go around the room so that we can introduce ourselves. I am Erica Denise and I am the um, Director of Learning and Creative Engagement for Actors Theater of Louisville. Alonzo? You're muted. I'm Alonzo Ramont. I'm the founder and artistic director of Redline Performing Arts. Alpheus? Good afternoon. My name is Alpheus Green. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Alpheus Green Jr. I am, <laughs> I am the producing artistic director of Tenuous Reality and Improv Troupe and an actor in the theater. Kajada? You're muted. You're muted. All right. Hi, my name is Sujata Pace. I am the PTC and casting coordinator at Actors Theater of Louisville. Larry? I'm Larry Muhammad. I'm a playwright and producer at Kentucky Black Repertory Theater. LaShondra. Greetings. I'm LaShondra Hood. I'm the coordinator of fine arts and youth education at Louisville Central Community Center. Janelle Renee. Hi, I'm Janelle Renee Dunn. Um, I am a Learning and Creative Engagement Associate for Actors Theater. Um, I am also the founder and executive director of NI Woman Play Fest. Yes. Rush. Hey, hey, Rush Stroud here, uh, producing artistic director for Faithwork Studios and uh, professor at Kentucky State University. I love it. <laughs> Thank you all so much for um, agreeing to be here on this panel to talk about um, this topic, which I think is excellent for the time uh, and perfect um, for this discussion. Uh, <laughs> and so I just want to jump right on in and let's um, start this conversation off with the first question. How has the Black experience in theater changed in the past five years? And what do you predict will happen in the next five to 10 years? And so anybody can just jump right on in. And ain't none of y'all shy, so come on. <laughs> well, I'll start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think sometimes starting might be easier to go in after everybody else. So let me get my two words in. Um, I think in the, in the past five years, something that has happened that I am extremely proud of as an African-American artist is that we're finally recognizing the value of African-American playwrights for African-American producers. It's one thing to be a performer, but on the totem pole of artistry, when we talk about producing shows and making it happen to tell the stories that we want to, we have to write the stories that we want to see or write the stories that's going to reflect life as we live it. Um, instead of through someone else's eyes from the outskirts, trying to realize or trying to write for how we live or how we see the world or navigate the world. Um, I appreciate Peach. that theaters also are trying to um, find the value. Bigger theaters are trying to, to really work on diversifying. I think we should come back to that word. But the idea that they are at least trying to, um, to recognize uh, different playwrights that aren't the same playwrights. And then when they do give us a show in the season, it don't have to be August Wilson because hey! Donald Morrisot is very capable. It can be Larry Muhammad. Very capable. And so giving these artists that space to allow their artistry to flourish, I think has been a thing that is on the up and up. And I'm proud that that uh, that I am an African-American artist that has had the um, opportunity to do some of their work, to engage with the language, because it sounds like the language I'm used to, not some made up version of what Black people kind of sound like, but it sounds like my mama in the kitchen talking to me 
or my daddy when he fussing at me or my brothers like it sounds like the language that i'm used to as opposed to trying to tune my ears to this new rhythm that nobody talk like no black person talk like that so i think that's something that has grown in the past five years <laughs> Yes. Somebody give Alexandra an organ. Where's Drop the organ? Right, right. <laughs> Drop the mic. Who lives? <laughs> and we're off. <laughs> What's the key chain. No. <laughs> and we're off. <laughs> Next question. Just to uh, <laughs> anybody want to add to that? Oh, uh, as a playwright. I, I, I mean, as a playwright, as a playwright, I would have to say that in <laughs> five years, I think our audience there's a, 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 an appreciation, I guess for black playwrights. I don't think that we're uh, produced anywhere near uh, the volume that we should be. And I don't know if it's necessary just black playwrights, but playwrights in general. I think we're, I often say that playwrights that are, are at the bottom of the food chain in American theater. I mean, I've been on my own shows most of the time. I've had a couple of shows go national and stuff like that. But uh, in the last five years, I think, there's a greater appreciation, especially for historical plays, which is one of the the uh, one of our brands. And I think in the next five years, I'm hoping in the next five years, even even local theaters would do more to develop black playwrights, to develop mm -hmm. local voices. Yeah. Did y'all hear how he just threw that in? I've had a few plays to go national. Yeah. I didn't yeah. want a name, uh, but Alonzo, you had something to add. Over. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Lissandra was saying, I think it's important. I think the needle is moving a little bit, but to have uh, black people and people of color sitting at the table of decision makers, that it's not just we're diverse because we bring in black actors. That's great, but we need to have people, our people, at the table making those decisions. And so I know I've had plenty of conversations um, with local theater companies about that very issue. Um, you know, it's, it's like, well, we're trying to do this and we're trying to do this. And it's like, yeah, but you consider yourself diverse because you do a black show once a year or whatever. In so February. Before, say it again. I said in <laughs> February. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so I think it is important to have those people at the table. I also think it's important to um, cast outside of the box as well. Um, so let's say you're doing a production of Les Mis. Les Mis has no color restrictions, right? So your Jean Valjeans, your Fontines, those people, you know, and, and as far as musicals, you know, they don't have to be white, that they can be people of color. Yeah. You're helping to change the system by your casting choices. And so that's always been big for me because not all black people are the same. Not all of us sing the same. Not all of us, like I'm not a big gospel singer. So like, that's not what I do. And so I had to fight a lot of times as an actor to even be seen for other roles. I've been told, oh, you're not right for that role. When I know I could sing circles around some of yeah. the other people in the room, but because of my skin color, it was affecting me getting cast. But I think that is starting to change, at least in our area, I've seen that. Um, a, a major shift in that. But I think it's because people, we've started to speak up. We're doing things like this, you know, where there are people of color in authority and in power positions that are helping to uh, to make that change. So I think that's really important. I'm glad and that you say that. Oh. Also, oh. Okay. Also, no, I just wanted to um, go off of uh, what Alonzo said about like the casting. And that's one, um, I started off as an actor, I'm an equity actor and stage manager. And one of the reasons why I um, shifted to casting is because when I was performing and I never saw anyone sitting behind the table that looked like me and that was making those decisions and I found that, you know, I want to give people the opportunity to perform. I want, you know, our, our voices to be heard. And um, I see now that we're shifting in like arts administration leadership as well, because I know you touched on that, like with Robert Barry Fleming, um, you have some other uh, POC artists, um, uh, artistic directors out there. And I think it's a shift. Um, and I think in the next five years, I think we'll see more of um, more diverse diversity in um, the theater spaces and leaderships. Um, 
and like I'm so humbled to be able to be a part of the casting team at Actors Theater, um, to be able to br um, bring those opportunities to my people. And that's something that I really, really wanted to do. And I'm so thankful for that opportunity. Me too. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to jump in and um, highlight tech as well, production. Um, I yeah. think like, I am starting to see more uh, Black technicians, um, designers, but I definitely think there's still a long way to go. And I think like the discussion around how to design for um, not just Black artists, but also um, brown artists as well and native artists as well like that conversation is starting to gain steam because like i don't know how many times i've gotten into um i've had bumps in the road as an actor about like talking about my hair um i literally cut my hair off on opening night for a show because the costume designer hair designer didn't want to have a real conversation about how to um work with my hair to fit this 1920s um, theme that uh, era that the show was in. And so I was like, fine, I'm going to take power over myself because, you know, I'm not letting you let me go on stage looking like Boo Boo the Fool. So uh, here we go. And um, or like how to put makeup on us. I mean, our skin tones are different. Like, yes, I'm light skin, but I have a lot of yellow tones. And so like how to even that out on the stage or how to light me on stage. Like, um, it's completely different than if someone, if a, a white body person is standing beside me and how do you um, make that, make it look, make me look my best on stage as I was, next to this white body person who, is, yeah. So I hope in the next five years that we put more of a spotlight on um, artists of color in tech. Um, now that we've highlighted, um, I don't I guess highlighting is the wrong word, but um, I feel like the, we've had great focus on casting on, um, arts administration on leadership and now let's have a real conversation about um, designers as well. Can I say something else? I think Rush was trying to jump in. Oh, real. okay. Oh, I, I thought you were looking for your mute button. Okay. Go ahead, Lashandra. Okay. So I answered the first part and my thoughts about where we've been or where we've come in the last five years. I think my ideas about moving forward or pushing forward is we're starting to see African Americans and people of color in general trickle into these higher places, but it's another thing entirely when they feel like they have the agency to speak up on behalf of the people that are are that look like them. Um, I I know I'm I'm pretty sure we're all very aware of the current situation um, with um, uh, his name escapes me. Is it George Floyd? Is that his name, George Floyd? And how I, I thought about like, he was suffocated as an African-American, he was suffocated on the street, but whether we're being physically, okay. whether we're being physically suffocated or not, we are in these positions and still feel like we can't breathe or can't express mm. ourselves because we don't have the power that they make us feel like we have just with this title. But if we say something, we're still in the same idea of, um, or space of feeling like we're going to be shunned or we're going to lose this position. So we're, I mean, when someone controls your airflow, they control you. We yes. are being suffocated in these rooms, not to be able to talk, not to be able to really express ourselves. This is just for their photo ops to say, we are diverse. Mm -hmm. We got black people on the team. They mm -hmm. write just smiling. And, and, and it's not that they have the the power to be able to speak on the behalf, on behalf of all of the people that will come after them as performers or otherwise. But I think it's interesting when we play with, when we flirt with this line of casting and it's not colorblind casting. We kind of um, went away from that terminology. You know, we're, we're color Thank conscious you. casting, but are we really that conscious? Because it's more than just saying, oh, this, this role wasn't written as a black person, but it's, it's looking deeper to say, 
what is this the story of this character and who's going to be cast uh, as their acting partner because regardless of if you intended for the audience to read into color or or see how how roles are played out if if, if it's a white man and a black woman and and the man is in a powerful position it changes the dynamic it, it the, the, the 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 dynamic is different if this was a white woman or a white man and a white man or a white man and a white woman even if the role wasn't written as any specific race or 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 back cultural background i think we have to have these people in the casting room with a voice not just in the room but in the room with a voice so that they can speak to, you know, if this line plays out this way, it, 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 it takes away this, this, this character's power. It takes away this actor's power. Sometimes I find it very hard to separate self from character when, when, when it's cutting too deep. You do the right show in the right time with the cultural situations going on. It's hard to, 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 to discern what is life and what is theater because theater reflects life. It, it, it reflects life. And so I think uh, in the next five years, I hope that not only will they put African-Americans in these positions, but that they will put them in a position and empower them to speak out or else it's just as pointless for them to even be in the room if they can't say anything. We're not a puppet. We're not, we're not gonna be fed scripts or, or have the, 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 the electronic meter going, showing us what to say. We have a voice and it ought to be heard. And I hope, I pray that as an artist, it's heard within the next five years as soon as possible. And that's my little piece for the next five years. <laughs> can we, can we <laughs> that point, right? And can we talk, can we talk right? on that about how like when you do have the artists, when you do have the people that do speak up or say something, how whiteness, how white supremacy is really quick to villainize that person and then you get labeled as a troublemaker black, or you get angry black woman angry black woman you know you get difficult nobody wants to work with you oh she's a diva oh blah 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 and it's like no i have the right as a person as a human being to speak my feelings because my feelings are valid and if what's going on right now in this room is not lifting me up to my highest self that I have the right to speak out about that just like you do yeah yeah and Alonzo touched on something that frustrates me in the community theater world here in Louisville is like don't just call me when you need a maid you know, don't call me when you need the black body in your show. And it's unfortunate that the only time I can get big meaty roles is if Rush or Alonzo cast me in one of their shows. You know, so that that really frustrates me so, so bad. And don't claim that you're diverse just because you called me in February to play Reba the maid and you can't take it with you. Sorry, I just, I had a moment. <laughs> or, 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 or white theaters, white theaters will call, call me I don't know if it's happening to anybody else, but they'll call you helping to ask for help for casting. Yes. Can you put out the word for, and I mean, the, the uh, theater community in Louisville isn't so big that everybody don't know each other. I don't know if, if me asking Erica to do something for, you know, name white theater. Now, will they come and see my shows? I suggest what I do. I go and see people acting and then I wait congratulate them and, 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 and talk to them a little bit. Why can't the white theaters come to our shows, you know, black companies put on, and then see the actors, see the actors, meet them in person, instead of trying to uh, make us the, the, the go-between or, or um, their boy to carry their water. Right. Because it's too much like right. They will take too much effort. Um, it's really about that simple. Um, they want to just reach out and say, how can you help me? Can you do this? As opposed to making that effort for themselves because they're used to just being able to look over and say, oh, hey, you would be great in my show and you would be great in my show um, instead of reaching outside of their own personal communities. That's just one of the uh, more intransigent, intransigent features of this um, 
uh, de facto segregation that we had still endure. Is it de facto? The secret unofficial desegregation that we still endure. Segregation that we endure. I'm gonna get all these words right. <laughs> I promise. Yeah. You know, I had a I had a recent spat with another theater company that I won't name. <coughs> I'm I'm gonna say that several times throughout this live. I think uh, <laughs> name them. <laughs> We've been there. <laughs> we all bring them out. Bring them out. <laughs> I probably got a story too. We could just have a story. Right, right. I think we all got stories. <laughs> uh -huh. like, of the same of the same theaters though. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, they called me and said, hey, you know, we're having auditions for this show. I won't say the name of the show. Um, can you send us some black people? And I'm like, you know, I rolled my eyes and I said, okay, you know, all right, okay, whatever. When are the auditions? Tomorrow. Oh, so your diverse casting or your color conscious casting, you know, you thought of that today when the auditions were tomorrow. <laughs> that have already been announced, you've been promoting it, it's been out there, and now you want to think about the diversity of your cast. And, you know, I, I had a pretty, you know, hard conversation, um, you know, with that person about that very thing, because like a pr something LaShondra probably said, it just resonated with me because even, um, even, even lighting designers, I think it's important that we have lighting designers that understand the way our skin looks under certain certain lights. I've argued with people and I'm like, take that blue light off of them. They look purple, you know, <laughs> like that people, you know, just don't understand. And I, you know, and it's like, no, that, this is, it's fine. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's fine for the white people um, on the other side of the stage. But um, just even having the, the wherewithal to think about um, how that those kinds of things affect our people and what we look like on stage. I think, and I think Janelle said it, you know, about costuming and hair and those things often get overlooked. We think about actors, we think about people in administration, but I think the designers on our, on our staffs, you know, it's really important that they learn to embrace, you know, what people of color look like under certain lighting, for example. Just wanted to get that out there. Yeah. Can I just say like it, it really gets to, for me, it's about being seen. And that's what really gets under my skin and hurts is that like, you don't see me as a person. You only see me when you need a black actress mm -hmm. and a black person. And it's like, how, I don't even really, I don't even think I have the words yet to articulate like the pain that I feel because I, I, I don't know, we didn't really get to check in with each other. So I don't know how everyone else is feeling over how everything has been playing out in the, in the country for the past two months since Ahmad. I cried um, today. Yes. I cried. And, you know, Angry. Yeah. I cried. And uh, it's just like, I can't breathe, you know, I can't breathe because here I am, I'm fighting for my voice to be seen as a person and all you can see is my blackness and my blackness is how, dictates how you're going to treat me. It's going to dictate whether you follow me down the street. It's going to dictate whether you follow me in the store. It's going to dictate if you're going to call the police and say that I'm harassing you and it's going to dictate how you cast this show. So you're not going to see me as Beatrice in uh, Much Ado About Nothing. You're not going to see me as X, Y, Z. I can't, e like, I can't even think of other characters right now because I'm just having a moment where my feelings are just like, this is where I am, is that I'm tired of fighting to be seen and not labeled. Yeah. And so, I think that goes to the point, uh, sorry, really quickly. When people start to ask, they say, well, why do you go and start your own theater company? <clears throat> you know, are you, aren't you dividing us more? And, <laughs> and, you know, I feel like that's maybe a, something that Rush can talk about too, but it's like, no, 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 no we are creating opportunity that ha we've been missing out on for years. 
the reason I stopped doing shows at certain places was because it was always, oh, well, you can be black guy number three in the ensemble or mm. it's hairspray or it's, you know, um, you know, uh, color purple or it's, yeah. you know, sister act. It's these same shows over and over again that you get to play these lead roles in. And I was so frustrated by that that I just went out and started doing my own stuff, my own cabarets, my own, you know, everything, because it's like, I want to, not just to feature me, but my people, these amazingly talented artists from our area who never get the recognition that they deserve. And if they do, it's a one-off. It's, oh, Erica got to play Effie in Dreamgirls. See you in five years when you do right. the role again. You know, um, it's that kind of thing. And so that's the reason that we often, you know, tell our own stories. And it's not just about Black shows. I, I always tell people with Redline, we don't do Black shows. We do shows <laughs> that are about people. Um, and oftentimes there are Black stories being told, but it is not about only doing shows for Black people. That is not what we are doing. We're creating a space where everyone is welcome, but we're going to, if I say I'm going to do, um, let's say, uh, you know, a show like uh, Phantom of the Opera, let's just say, then I'm going down my list of people that can play Phantom or Christine, and it doesn't matter what color they are. I'm not thinking about a white person or a black person. I'm thinking about who's going to be the best person for this role. And I want somebody to come in and shock me and surprise me and force me to cast you based on your audition, based on your talent level. And that's it. Unless it specifically calls for a person of color or a Caucasian person, it does not matter. Now, when you get into a conversation about can a white person be, you know, Effie, you know, then that's a whole different conversation that some people probably need to be schooled on. Yeah. Uh, and can we have a white Sealy? I'm sorry, we can't, you know. A uh, white Martin Luther King. Mar uh, yeah, Dr. white Martin I was going to bring that up. <laughs> that's right. But it's out there. People really, and people will fight with you about those kinds of conversations, for sure. But I want to hear, I wanted to ask Rush, because I know he, you know, with him also having a theater company in that same vein, I just feel like that's an important conversation, if that's okay, Erica. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what we try to do, uh, like all of you all, is just try to provide a space where we can come and grow. I, that we don't always, uh, it just goes back for me of having opportunities. Having opportunities, we don't always uh, have the resources and or the opportunities that our white counterparts have growing up. We don't, and we're all fortunate here because we've been probably been in theater or performing all our lives, but that's not always the key, or always the case, excuse me. So you see a group, of, especially here, of saturated talent, but it's uncultivated or it's untrained or they have it or they feel intimidated or things that they don't know or, or just opportunities with roles as cast. And so, so that's what we, that's what I try to do. That's what I, what, what we really try to do is, is find a place where if and when they are cast in other productions and or other companies that they can they survive for lack of better words. And we produce our own thing. Some, and, and, and we have, generally all african-american cast we do have a few folks that like to hang out with us and we love all of them but the but the goal is to serve the underserved by not just providing access to see a show that doesn't involve you or see a show that happens to involve you so that and it's a little different and and i think the other thing when you talk about if we're going to stay on this question is what their audience wants to see because they, maybe they would love to cast us in something or maybe they wouldn't maybe you know john valjean is white you know those type of things but what is their audience going to pay tickets to see so it's both and so i think that the whole the old adage of if you're not you don't have a seat at the table just build your own and figure it out and and, and keep building those moments and keep building those organizations and and finally turning those into institutions where you have your folks that want to pursue it that have never thought they could ever, I have some, I have some actors, we, excuse me, I say we at the organization, it's not just, we have some actors that are over 50 that are brilliant, just never had the opportunity or life circumstances, whether it's, 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 it's having, you know, holding down what you have to hold down to hold things down, uh, just not having those opportunities. So I think, um, 
we will see that. But we try to provide those opportunities, whether it's a training ground or whether for you to go to the next level where it's, it's an, a recreational moment where you can express yourself. Those are things that, that we, that I am personally responsible for, I feel like, in my life. I don't know if I answered your question, but that, that was it. <laughs> and Russ, we've proven over and over and over again how profitable our productions are and can be. And every time we've uh, brought a production to a white theater company, it is sold out. 10 times over and they're asking, okay, we need to add another show. We, we, didn't, we, couldn't, we can't believe that it's sold out like this. And it's always you know, met with rave reviews. And so that's why I don't understand why it can't consist, happen on a consistent basis. And that you know, it doesn't have to be the black show, but why can't you have feature more people of color? Because it is profitable. And who, who's still waiting on tickets for Hamilton? Mm. You got some? <laughs> you guys like, I'm about to get that I'm sorry. Part. I actually saw it in, in Chicago. So I'll see it again if there are tickets. I love that Larry keeps dropping the humble brags. You know that I actually saw it in Chicago. I've, I've gone national <laughs> 17 times before. Um, <laughs> but I did want to touch on the importance of Black people creating theater in order to create opportunity for Black people because I myself, whatever level of success you want to attribute to me or say that I have is directly uh, traceable to, to Rush starting his theater. Like I don't, I don't really get involved in theater without Rush. I don't get further training and go even further and learn how to carry a show if Larry Muhammad doesn't get involved in theater and have his Kentucky Black Rep going. I, I don't have these opportunities because uh, just as Erica was playing Reba and you can't take it with you, I was playing George and you can't take it with you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, and I go to that audition, and in this audition, I go in and I do, I do fine in the audition. Um, well, actually, no humble brag, I killed it. I did not audition and, for that, Alphaeus. They, they just called me. <laughs> well, I, I, may have, I didn't have to audition, I showed up. You know, I, I showed up and I was Negro. And so they were like, <laughs> okay, so you've got it. Um, <laughs> do you have friends? <laughs> word, word. But here's the here's the thing though. I didn't get to all. I only I was only looked at for George. Was not seen for any other role or anything else. From the moment I walked into the room, yes, we have a Negro. Let's make sure he can speak and walk without having a stroke, and then we can cast him. Oh, he did speak and walk and walk without having a stroke. Excellent. And so that's one of the huge things, like without those, those grounds in which to really uh, uh, grow, I, I'm not here, wherever here is. Um, so that's huge for everybody to go off and create their own thing. Part of why I did my own improv troupe. I got, mm -hmm. It's exhausting being the only uh, chip in the cookie. Mm -hmm. as the, being the only one who gets the black references. It's, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so you have to go out and do this sort of thing to spread the art and create the opportunity. And let, let me <laughs> tell you that as a writer, what you, as a writer, what I'm trying to do is, is tell our stories. Mm -hmm. um, you can colorblind casting. I'm all for black actors getting work however they can. But to LaShondra's point, if you have a racy mixed couple, the audience, we're uh, living in a racist society. I mean, so people are going to perceive it based on their own experience and based on what they're going through in their lives, based on news and stuff. But what I try to do is tell our stories. All of my shows are, have uh, multiracial cast, but they're all um, from the Black perspective. All the leads are Black, and it's universal. I mean, I don't... I, I don't get the argument that uh, if you do a black show, our lives matter. Our lives are as universal as the white people's lives. Yes. <laughs> I, I, yes. No. I, I, I just did. I just did fences earlier this year, and we had talkbacks after the shows, and it was amazing to me the way people talked about the story of fences as if it was some sort of distant thing 
that isn't really relatable. And of course, when I say people, you know, some of the white audience members, they're like, you know, some of these things are still going on. I'm like, okay, hold up. First of all, a lot of the issues with the racial discrimination, they're still continuing. But uh, are we really acting like a story about a man who's unfaithful to his wife doesn't have relevance today? That this doesn't have relevance to to audiences worldwide? What are you What are you saying? You know, and and so this idea that our story is so unique and it's not it's not relatable to other people. It's directly drawn from white supremacy because that's the only way you can think that our stories of family and life and growing up and becoming is somehow not relatable. You're muted. You're muted. I was surprised uh, earlier this year having directed Choir Boy, you know, that so many of the audience members were, were just surprised at how much they related to the story. Um, and I thought that's so interesting to me because it's a universal story um, that, that can be told. But I think what Larry's point is, you know, being a writer is we have to have more of our stories being told. And I believe that there are many, many stories written by our people but sometimes they don't get the platform that they need to, um, to reach the masses. You know, it takes money to put on a show. Often people don't realize that it takes 10,000, 15,000, $30,000 to produce one show. Wow. Um, and, um, and so people don't often realize that. And so I think the way that people can change and be an advocate for this is to support our stories. That when Larry is doing you know, a production like he just did. Um, uh, Sweet Evening Breeze. Sweet Evening Breeze earlier. Yeah, right year. after y'all. Yeah, and just going out to support those kinds of stories because so that the more of those stories can be told. But I think it's important because oftentimes white stories become the center of theater. I mean, those are the, the most popular. Um, uh, think about the conversation about Hamilton and how many people were up in arms about well, why can't I be in Hamilton? You know, and it's like, you could be, but I, and I'm sure what, if the rights are ever released, there's gonna be a lot of all white productions yeah. of, of Hamilton, you know? Um, and so uh, I think it's just important, like he said, to just keep telling our stories and pushing those, uh, pushing those forward. And I want RPA even to, to recommit to, to helping tell those stories as well that are, that are for our people and written by people like Larry. So Larry, let's talk about it, make it happen. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, guys, I want to move from this question so that we can um, address the audience. And um, please, people that are watching, keep the questions coming. We will get to them as we can. So uh, Megan Burnett said, um, please offer your advice on improving opportunities for actors of color at a school that is mostly white. And what plays can I direct that don't margin marginalize people of color? Well, um, as a director of a predominantly <laughs> white program, um, you know, I think that is such a great question. Um, and I don't know what the dynamic of the school is, but I think it's important to not only choose shows that you can use, you know, people of color, but to have conversations with the students you have about what the future of theater looks like. And, and I, I, directing Hairspray once, I had a, this was around the um, Alton Sterling shootings and a couple other um, shootings that took place. And I just woke up one day, just pissed. I mean, just like, it just hit me like a ton of bricks that like, man, I'm a black man. And I think oftentimes I was spoiled because I was working in predominantly white communities. So I wasn't really even thinking about my blackness most of the time, um, as far as my community and my people. And so it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And that day I, I sat down with the cast along with uh, Pat Matheson, who was in the show, shout out to Pat, about why this story is important. Hairspray, yes, it's a fun musical. There's glitter and confetti and all of those things, but it's really the story that matters. And so I think choosing material where you can actually teach kids and then in the classroom, teaching them about black artists, black directors black writers from there are black writers and, and 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 directors and performers from the 50s that you can be teaching on you know teach them about the harlem renaissance and how our art began to shift and people began to take notice when we started to produce it ourselves 
just as they did in the Harlem Renaissance. And so there's a lot of ways I think that we can be creative in not just finding space for our students of color, but, but teaching our non-Black students about Black theater and what that means to the world, not just Black people. And I think a lot of times it's about choosing a, a, a good story. I mean, I've done two Kafka shows wherein I was just, I just happened to be a black dude in these Kafka shows, the metamorphosis and in um, the trial. And it was less about, I, di I didn't feel marginalized at all. I felt like I was a part of the show because it was a good story. And a lot of it is on the director to create the sort of community and atmosphere or working space wherein you can feel comfortable just making the choices that you feel led to make as a as an actor as a performer it, it's it's and i think as long as you take a step a moment to kind of step outside of yourself and say eh, well maybe i won't necessarily cast this black person in this particular role because that would be that would be kind of trash to put them in that role just take that moment to think about it but it doesn't have to be like there's some great library of shows that uh, will stop the marginalization of, of folks in theater. And I like Cox. Oh, you want to add something to that? Um, yeah. Also, like professors, stop trying to, especially white professors, stop trying to tell black people how to be black. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I've I, I have heard it myself. I've been in other like POC uh, spaces from other artists talking about. Yeah, I had this professor that told me I wasn't black enough, or I didn't. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what does that mean? You don't know? be a little more urban. Can you be a little more, more urban? What is urban? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> um, excuse me, you must have got your PhD in blackness by um, Tom Hawk and Coast or something. I don't know, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. And so, and stop breaking it up like, okay, now we're going to cover black theater. Like we're covering theater. Here are different artists that we're going to discuss. We're, um, we're not just going to highlight Susan Lord Parks because she was the first Black woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for um, drama. We're going to also, we're going to look at um, uh, Dominique Morceau. We're going to look at Jeremy um, O'Hara. You know, we're going to look at all of these artists, all of these as part of um, the curriculum, we're not just going to break it down into this is Black theater, this is queer theater, this is uh, um, Latin Latinx theater. Stop, just put it all out there. Just like we, just like you put Shakespeare out there and say, oh, Shakespeare, let's learn this. It's been half the semester on Shakespeare. Let's just do that with all of the plays and just put them out there and stop labeling it. <laughs> and, but if I agree with that fully, but I also think that when we do cover uh, black playwrights, like their picture needs to be up because of the way white supremacy works, they'll just assume that that playwright is <laughs> it's white. They're like Dominique Morisot. Oh, she's from France. She must be French, <laughs> you know. And so you kind of got to put it up because there are people who don't know. And I'm going to be breaking news to people that Alexandra Dumas is black or was black you know and it's not a white dude who wrote the count of monte cristo right and so uh you know that that just as long as we put the picture up to i'm good with i guess like when i was in grad school it was amazing to me how my professors in my graduate program i was the only person of color in my um graduate program and i remember um we had to bring monologues and my teacher was like well maybe you should not do all August Wilson monologues. And it wasn't even an August Wilson monologue. <laughs> it just amazes me how they don't try to educate themselves. And it's like, like I'm the only black person and I have to educate my classmates and my professors. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's just so tiring for me to do the work for you. And it's like, you're not even attempting 
to relate to me or how you relate to me. I had a teacher say, well, I had a black boyfriend before. What mm. does that have to do with anything theater and what we're talking about right now? I do not care about that. So it's just, it's, it's just amazing that, and it's just, like you said, it's, it's just exhausting. It's very but it's a, it's a systemic issue in our education system because those mm. people are just teaching what they were taught and they were, they taught what they were taught. And so, you know, I remember working at a predominantly white school and most of the kids had never heard of Langston Hughes. Um, you know, it, I was shocked and we did a Harlem Renaissance project starting the next day because, mm. you know, but I think we just need more people in those classrooms that are willing to um, go beyond what they've been taught in the classroom. Uh, and do that work, like you said, for themselves. Yeah. And don't make me the voice of all black people when I'm the only black in the room of all white people. I don't. Oh, person. So what do you think? So what do you think? What are you right. Oh, I, you know I, I, about I, chicken I, and watermelon, Erica. <laughs> what, what are your people saying? What are your people saying? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with being the voice of all black people. <laughs> Janae Flanagan wants to know a role that you know in your soul that you would kill but wouldn't get due to your race. Ooh. Cinderella for me. And if you're looking for a slightly overweight Cinderella that's <laughs> black, <laughs> girl. <laughs> little bit and how I learned to drive. I'm like mm -hmm. chomping at the bit for that role, for it to direct that show. Oh, that. Anybody else? Okay, the only thing I, mm, is problematic. So I was probably gonna keep it in the back of my head, but a role that I would do if, if I could would be Tracy Turnblad. And that's because it speaks to something not not just about, I mean, because that show speaks to like everybody not having to fit in the cookie cutter size. I think I can move. Matter of fact, I know it can. But we, I just don't have another role where I can show that off. But I think that that's a role that I could do, I would do, but I can't never do that one. Not ever, 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 ever. <laughs> you can't do it. Never, not never. <laughs> So if, if Larry Muhammad want to write another play, uh, if he want to write a musical this time, and it'd be about a plus size girl. <laughs> 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 I'm here. That's on my list. It's on my list. It might be his 18th show that goes national. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I don't have a I don't have a role that I that that I can think of that I was like oh I would love to play that but I'm black uh, <laughs> because I, yeah I'm I'm a little too cocky for that uh, I <laughs> there's a role that I would love to play but my voice is a little too deep and uh, that's I would love to be uh, gosh I can see his face now but I can't think of the, the character's name though Little Shop of Horrors uh, Seymour Seymour yeah yeah. yeah. I just, I just don't have the range, but that's it. Tell me how I'm ready to get out of here. <laughs> I don't have a role. I just usually, I audition for everything. I just go in um, with the mindset that I'm going to kill it and change your mind, I guess. It's just like, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, I'm going to be the, I know, the description is for a certain thing, but I'm still going to go. And usually I go and I think my, my thought process is like, I'm going to go in and I'm going to leave it all on the floor and I'm going to walk, just walk out. And mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Everybody, the, the role that they wanted, they wanted to say something. Okay. Well, I, I, also, I've been hitting up Rush. I gotta play the uh, the lady in green uh, next time he does for Color Girl. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Somebody walked away with all my. That's a whole different issue. <laughs> <laughs> Anitra oh. Allen says, 
what do we tell our black children who don't yet understand what they have to face and who live in a post-racial world? How do we prepare them for reality? Mm. First by accepting it's not post-racial. I don't know where that misnomer came from. I guess because Obama's election. But racism is, is part of this country's DNA. I mean, we were slaves in America longer than we've been so-called free. I mean, 1863, 400 years of slavery ended in 1863. Then there was a 100 years of lynching. 1963, they were bombing little black girls in, in uh, churches. I mean, tell them the truth. I mean, if you look all around, I was listening to Bella Ray on the radio today, and she said she talked to one of the girls, and it was about these recent killings of police, by police. Killings of black men by unarmed black men by police and by vigilantes, uh, that situation down in Florida. But tell them the truth. Yeah, I'm facing that now because I have a, a two-year-old, soon to be three, and he's starting to get out of that baby phase. I mean, he's even saying like, I'm like, hey, baby. And he's like, no, not baby. I'm Jojo. <laughs> um, and it's like, you are almost at that age of awakening of, of seeing what the innocence that you have right now is soon to kind of fade away. Um, because you're going to see this what we call trauma porn of black bodies being abused on and killed and murdered and shot down in the streets. Um, and so it's just about having those conversations and not hiding it um, from them. And when they're ready to talk about it or process it or realizing that oh they may be processing it in a way that they don't have the language for yet they just know that something doesn't feel right um and they see i mean my he's only two but he already has a sense that in my opinion, that he's black. And I, I say that because he gravitates to um, into the Spider-Verse. And when he talks about Spider-Man, he has the, the Miles Spider-Man uh, mask. And then he sees the red one and he refers to that one as the other Spider-Man. Um, he watches this little um, five-year-old drummer named LJ, a little drummer boy, who's this little black boy who just, he loves him and he watches those videos and then he drums all day because he's like, oh, this is what I, this is a person that looks like me because then he'll go and look in the mirror and he'll look himself in his little mask and his um, costumes or whatever and he looks at himself and he's just like, I'm Jojo. And so it's saying, validating that like, yes, you are Jojo. When you are ready, let's have that conversation um, and not hiding it from from him. And I do hold my breath because he loves everybody and he likes to run up to random strangers, doesn't matter who they are, and give them a hug. And it's like, <laughs> you can't, <laughs> you can't do that, sweetie. You can't, you can't do that. Um, but yeah, now I'm just rambling. But um, it's just having those conversations, having those conversations and letting them process their feelings and realize that we've all got trauma that um, we are living with that's in our DNA. We have generational trauma that's literally in our DNA that comes out in different ways and recognizing that and healing that trauma within ourselves and then creating space for our black and brown children to um, heal and grow and not carry on that trauma, but lift up and be their highest self um, and create their own version of blackness that's just gonna be even more beautiful and extraordinary than what we may see right now. Okay guys, so 
This okay. is scheduled to be an hour, but if everybody's okay, we can agree to extend it a little bit longer. Um, and I want to take a few more questions from the audience. We only got to one of can the I answer that last one? eight questions that I had, but yeah, go ahead, Rush. Sorry, just it's, it's our future. You know, I got I speak to that. Just um, informing them, especially ones that are pursuing a performing arts um, career, that you're going to work, have to work twice as hard to get half as far, and that's just a reality. Um, instead of spending your lifetime trying to prove yourself, proving that you're equal or proving that this, spend that time improving yourself, and you get to a point where they can't ignore you. You get to a point where, where you're so good they cannot ignore what you have. Don't rest on your talent. Always make sure that they are in programs. And the challenge with I don't want to go sideways. The challenge uh, with that is the opportunity to cultivate their talent. Um, many times, the things that are supported, the things that are, are whether or not they're a single parent family or a, a, a dual parent family that is trying to make ends meet, they don't have those luxuries all the time. And then the, the programs that are sometimes uh, available to them aren't always up to par with what they need to survive as performing artists. So as a parent, I would say support them, figure out what they're made to do and support them, whether you think it's going to work out or not, because what you don't want is an adult full of regrets, an adult full of, well, I felt like I was built this way, but my parents said it wasn't a good way. And, and there, is some, there are some things, you know, you know what your kids can do and what they can't do or what you feel they're, they're um, they're specifically made to do, but provide that unbridled support because it is a lot of work. It is, there's no, at times you will never be good enough and that's okay as long as you are proving it and judging it against yourself, not anybody else, not what anybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And, and you have to continue to, to know that and have the support system in place. So that's what I would say of our future, of our future, our future artists specifically. It's a life lesson, but you will have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And you're fighting, you're fighting your folks, you're fighting your folks. You're, it, it, it's, it's an uphill climb, but you can do it. It's just perseverance. Absolutely. I want to take like two more questions from the audience. They're coming in so fast. Um, and I want to recognize Idris Goodwin, who has been very vocal tonight in the chat. Um, he is a brilliant black playwright that joined our community uh, a few years ago as the artistic director for stage one. He since moved on to bigger and better things, decided he didn't need Louisville anymore. And he, <gasps> he's leaving. <Yeah>. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But he does have a question and he said, what do you feel compelled to create in this moment, giving all of our challenges? Can you repeat the question? What do you feel compelled to create in this oh. moment, given all of our challenges? And maybe that's a question for you, Larry, as the playwright. Um, uh, you know, I'm writing a play about James Baldwin. Um, the producer in New York that I worked with, uh, for a while I was kind of annoyed with him <laughs> because he would call me all the time suggesting all of these projects. And I recently wrote a play uh, about voter suppression. I get into social issue. I get, I get into topical type of theater. And because voter suppression would drive me up a wall. And these shootings were driving me up a wall, but and I've sent it to him, and the uh, the cast was a little too large, but he 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 kept not pestering me. But then I had to wake up and think, man, well, here's somebody. I mean, <laughs> wonder or wonders. Here's somebody that can produce my work, who's interested in my work, and he's encouraging me to write some. And he came up with this this project about James Baldwin and the characters of James Baldwin, my Angelou, Miles Davis, and Baldwin's brother, David, who was uh, a bartender at this fabulous joint called McHale's in New York. It was, you know, you know all of the great, you know, Maya Angelou, Lena Horan one night, if, you know, they, they were all there because Baldwin's brother was a bartender and Baldwin would come in there and he'd like, attract all this attention, so. I'm working on that and it's taking up my time and attention during this time when I can't get out and do nothing else. If I can also, 
Go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, okay. I, if I can also uh, speak to what I am compelled to create, it's not um, a tangible script or anything, but it's, I feel compelled to create a space where the children that I am working with as young African-American artists, budding artists, that they feel empowered to be able to inhabit any space, go into any space knowing that they are enough. And I don't know what that looks like or how I continue Erica's legacy, but that is what I, I, I feel like I have to do. I don't want them to ever feel like they are limited to one kind of work or one kind of story or one kind of character, but that I, I help them to, to mold themselves as, crea as, as creators, as, 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 as artists that can tell any story because we have the talent to do so, because we have the chops to do so, because it has been poured in us how to tell our own stories, but also how to understand things like Shakespeare, that, that we should not be intimidated by these things. And so in this moment, I feel like it is my duty to work with these young people to create a space knowing that they are enough. Inside LCCC, which is primarily African American, we have other people, other uh, other people from other backgrounds to come in every now and again, but primarily African American. But you're not limited to LCCC, that you can go into any other theater program, into any other theater space. And uh oh, don't don't dare me say it outside of theater in general, that we have the ability to do whatever we need to do. I yeah. feel like mm -hmm. with the world the way it is right now, we have to know on our own that we are enough. Because if we're waiting for other people to say that we are enough, we're gonna be waiting the rest of our lives. Yeah. So I think it's important to catch them when they five and six, when I'm, when they first coming into the program, mm -hmm. to let them know that. Mm -hmm. So when they go out as a senior graduating, that they know that they are enough. And I don't think it's just limited to theater, but I think theater is a beautiful tool to be able to empower children. I know people write it off as entertainment, that it's just entertainment, but, but we are so much more than that. Mm -hmm. I was watching this video, uh, mm, Idris Goodwin had actually mentioned how artists are, what he say, it was so, it was so profound. He said, artists are, um, cultural engineers i think that's what he said don't let me misquote you but mm -hmm. how how we have <laughs> so much influence on the world that when they go out yeah. out of the program that they come in with me as babies i want them to walk out with their heads held high and i'm sure that's that's every parents especially every african-american's parents dream but i i think it's it's a community thing they, they ought to experience that same level of confidence and those same nuggets being poured into them with all of the, uh, the adults that they encounter, all of the leadership that they encounter. And I figure if I'm gonna be working with kids, I need to be added to the list to help influence and encourage the things that their parents are already pouring into them. But I feel like this is my duty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I was and one of the intentional, uh, sorry, Rush, I was intentional about casting our brown babies at LCCC in roles that weren't technically written for them. And I got a lot of pushback from that. You know, I did a Christmas Carol and with the all black cast um, and a black female as Scrooge. Like, who does that? You know, <laughs> my bell in Beauty mm -hmm. and the was black with an afro puff and so i was intentional about those those mm -hmm. cast those shows that i actually chose to um produce for lccc just so that i could let our brown uh black and brown babies know that they can do and be anything that they want to and they're just as good as as their counterparts so i have some i have something for yeah i have something for whoever it was they gave you pushback <laughs> stop <laughs> 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 Where's my that's, phone? That's what they give. Uh, <laughs> um, Whoever it was. I think, and Erica, I think there needs to, and, and uh, LaShondra, I think, especially in, in, in it being one of the premier training programs for our, our kids in the, the city, there has to be support. There's no reason why they don't have facilities. There's no reason why they don't have anything that they need to succeed. And that's, that's, that's another topic for another time, and we don't need to get into that. But the reality is, is that you're still working on limited resources. If you are the facility in the city, which is Louisville Central Community Center, that are seeing the most uh, kids come through of color with, you know, pursuing this, 
then you should want for nothing. You, you, you shouldn't need anything. It should be whether it's government, whether it's local communities, whether it's adults, we have to make a point where it is important. We love the Denzels, we love the Samuel Jacksons, we love all of them studied, all, Har all of them have studied, all the prominent actors, but we don't see the value in training programs and or supporting them. And I get it, we don't always have that luxury. We don't always have the discretionary income to do what we need to do, but people, there are people that do that need to support what is happening right here in the city. And I think it's important that we create spaces for those kids after they leave, like an LCCC, that, that their dreams aren't crushed when they go to an audition and they aren't even seen for a bell or that kind of thing. I think it's important that we have spaces that, that once they're adults, they can move into um, where they feel comfortable. Um, and I was just going to say, one of the things that I'm trying to do is I'm actually starting a... Um, a theater festival, a play, a play festival um, called Page to Stage, so that we can feature more new works and you know people like Larry and and other playwrights you know in our area. I just think it's a really really important thing, and sometimes I overlook it because I'm a musical guy. I'm a big musical. I want a I want a full orchestra. I want glitz and glam and sparkle and glitter and um, all of those things. But I think we have to sometimes get to the foundation of everything. And one of the things I just want to piggyback on what Rush said is that we have to do the work, that we should not just rely on our talent. And oftentimes people of color, you know, for whatever reason, we, you know, a lot of us can sing or we're naturally gifted in that area because we sang in church or those kinds of things. But I think we have to teach our kids to do the work. You need to go to dance class. You need to go to acting class. You need to go to voice lessons. Even if you are naturally talented, that's great. Appreciate it but let's take it to the next level and get training. Don't forsake training. I think our kids should always be in training. Even if they're doing show after show after show after show, they need to be in classes and learning and developing and being stretched and being groomed for that next level of their career. I just think that's so important. And I just wanna encourage all of our, the parents of our students of color is to keep them in classes. And there's plenty of opportunity in this city Rush has a lot of stuff. I have stuff. LCCC has stuff. There's a lot of organizations that, you, you know, your kids can be learning from. I just think that's really, really important. Yeah, um, I would say I'm compelled to create um, truly a space of healing um, and taking, uh, so I produce, founded Anti Woman Play Fest, which um, lifts up the voices of women of color playwrights. And currently, um, we're in our third year, um, and currently it's a 10 minute play festival, but I am really compelled in this time of quarantine to really go full hog in the true vision that I've had for ANI from the very beginning of making this a very full fledged theater festival. Um, where it's uh, like the National Black Theater Festival, like it, the Atlanta um, Black Theater Festival is on that level, but it's completely for women of color artists highlighting our voices and creating a space to be heard, to be seen, to heal, and to just come together as women of color and just be like, yes. Um, but in realizing that just because women of color are the playwrights, the directors, the producers, it doesn't exclude everyone else. Um, because the way we see things is we already include everyone else. We don't write the plays that have been submitted. Some, some are specific, but are generally open to any person um, and can be cast by any person, um, whether you're black, white, um, Asian, Latinx, etc. And so um, I'm really compelled to uh, jump, go full hog and just really build up a Um. I so, oh, go ahead, Sujat. I'm sorry. Real quick for me, um, I'm currently developing and mapping out a plan for me um, to have my own production and casting company. And 
But within that, I want, um, I am creating, I've already laid it out, um, a workshop where I can take to high schools, undergrad and graduate programs and teach them the business about, um, about casting. Um, I don't think that, I know that I didn't receive everything all that I felt like I needed in those programs so just that platform to learn about contracts to learn about agents to learn about managers you know so that they're better prepared to go out into the world to um and have these tools to be the best that they could be yeah okay guys so um Pat Matheson said, so why can't we challenge the stereotype and cast an all white show with black actors? And I think we've done that within our companies. Alonzo, you have Rush, you've done that with Frozen and Moana and Little Shop of Horrors, you know, and I think that question should be posed to our um, white um, directors and producers um, and see how they would feel about that. So I think that's a question for them. Um, and then we've got Kevin Moore who is um, actually going to be joining uh, the Lace Department at Actors Theater as an apprentice with us. Yes, congrats, Kevin Moore. So he's gonna be working with me. Um, but he wants to know, how do younger performers of color have this type of inclusion conversation with their older white colleagues? Oftentimes in collegiate theater, people of color are looked over or pushed into stereotypical roles. How do we begin the conversation towards equality in theater without being seen as rude or the angry black person? And we kind of touched on that at the beginning of the conversation. Um, when I was an undergrad, um, I, this was what, 2000, early 2000. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I'm that age old where I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> um, but uh, long story short, the senior, the last production of the season was the senior showcase. And um, all of, if you were interested in directing, you could propose a show. I proposed the Color Museum. They chose The Mousetrap by um, a white director. And it hurt and um, I got heated and went um, went before the faculty and questioned and challenged the curriculum. Um, I gathered all of the curriculum that I had had for the past four, three, four years in the theater department and said, why, why out of all of these plays, and I mean, it's two bagfuls of plays, out of two bagfuls of plays, only three are by um, black playwrights. And that was Top Dog and Underdog. It was an August Wilson piece and then uh, one other, and I can't remember the third one. But why is that? Why, how come since I've been here, and I'm pretty sure since the beginning of this theater program, there hasn't been a play on the main stage by a person of color. Um, and so it's, one, it's finding um, your team, those allies, and saying, who's going to stand with me and vocally say, yes, why aren't, um, we covering these people, why aren't we, why are our black students being categorized, being stereotyped into these roles? And then it's also just um, being vocal yourself and not saying, well, this is, it's going to get better once, once I leave. Um, and sometimes, you, I don't want to say knock some heads, but yeah, knock some heads and be okay being labeled rude because not everyone's going to uh, agree with you. Um, and you have to know within yourself that I'm not rude. I'm just speaking my truth. And eventually, I do believe that change will come. I mean, change is coming. Change is happening and it's slowly, gradually happening. I mean, my theater program, um, I went to Berea College, they have changed drastically, like the students as like a rainbow coalition. Um, the faculty is um, 
they have like black faculty um they're doing shows they're diversifying the season and everything um so i i and I've, and again, kind of to the earlier point is that like professors, you got to educate yourself. You got to stop waiting for black people to educate you because we're exhausted. I'm tired of teaching white people how to not be racist. <laughs> I think I, there's something you said that was very important. I just want to jump on piggyback, say that as well, that you can't go through life worrying about being seen as this or see, being seen as that. Um, get used to the idea that people are going to see you as rude or as the angry black whatever, insert whatever. Uh, a, a thing that, uh, that you're going to have to balance is when to be judicious about doing that and then also realizing that at some point, you know, you're not responsible for, the, for other people's stupidity. I mean, if, if they're dumb, they're dumb. That's not your cause to take up or, or modify yourself around. You can't help their deficiencies. Yeah. I was just going to piggyback what you said. It is important that we realize sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's not easy. And I, as a young actor, I spoke up maybe too much uh, and maybe I didn't have the right language or the eloquency of what I was trying to say at the time. And I, there were theaters I was, I, you know, I didn't get hired back at because I spoke up, you know, um, when I felt like things, you know, when I felt like the pay wasn't fair for the people of color. And that comes from a local theater, um, but I won't say the name. Um, you know, but these people who had been there years and years, people of color, you know, there were people making twice as much as I was, as a, and I was a lead, and they were in the <laughs> ensemble first show you know, um, making ma literally double what I was making. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that, I mean, yeah, I was 22, 23 mm -hmm. years old, but I'm going to speak up. You're going to hear from me. And so, but I think it's easier said than done, especially college students, because you're stuck there for four years. <laughs> and so you don't want to be pigeonholed into, um, but I think what Janelle said is finding those allies that can stand with you and really go into the right people at the right times in power and not making it about you because you didn't get a role you wanted or that kind of thing, but looking on the whole, the program overall and the future of the program um, as well. But I think, I think it's tough because like you said, there, there just aren't that many people of color in those positions, but I think there are white people who are allies there, especially in the arts that, that do want to see, the, the needle move that we can trust to help move it forward into the right direction, but often it's just ignorance. And so I think important conversation, conversations like this are really important to help kind of move the needle in the right direction. Absolutely. Okay, guys, I wanna go ahead and wrap this up, uh, but I wanna take one last um, question from Tamika Prince who says, how important do you think it is for actors of color to do their homework when it comes to researching shows they do, not just black shows, but all shows? And I think Alonzo, you touched on that a little bit. It, to me, and I say this every show, we gotta do the work. Let, this, is, this is not just a black show or whatever. Um, you know, I'm looking at doing a couple of productions. I mean, I think this pandemic paused everything. And so it's making me rethink some of the things that we want to do. Um, but yeah, it's just really important that, you know, so many kids, you know, I, I stumbled into theater by accident. Uh, and a lot of the kids that I was performing with, you know, had been in dance classes since they were three, four, five years old, voice lessons, they could afford all of it. My mama was like, boy, <laughs> I can't afford no uh, $50 for a 30 minute voice lesson, you know, <laughs> like um, you better get on that piano and practice, you know? And so I think that environment was just a little bit different. And so that's what, but there are programs now that are being intentional about, um, you know, cheaper pricing. I know me, it, for me, it's not just about the money. Yes, we have to make money, but I would rather you be there and we help you figure out how you're going to pay for it than you not be there at all. And so I think doing the work is so important and teaching the kids that work ethic, that if, if this is something that you want to do, like Rush said, you're probably going to have to work twice as hard for the opportunities that you get. And that is not fair. I'm not saying that that's the way it should be. It's just, the, it's, it's just how it is currently. And so 
do the work, learn the learn what you got to learn, know the playwrights, know the musicals. You should know who, you know, uh, Melba Moore is and these other people who came before us and helped pave the way. I'm really big on that. Even our local uh, actors, for example, I'm so big on honoring those people who helped pave the way, you know, mm -hmm. at a lot of white theaters in the 80s, the early 90s you know, um, and, and really learning about what things were like for them. And so I do think doing that work, that's, that's the easiest way I can say it is just do the work, whatever the work is in your specific area. Just along to what you said, like even doing the work before you go into an audition, like you want to know the play, right? You want to read the play if you can get your hands onto it. Some people don't know that. Um, I know I do it. Um, if you're going in for um, an audition and you can reach out to me, uh, a lot of people or some people ask me for the script if they can't have it. And I think most casting people or most theaters will offer that to you because we want you to be great. We want you to, you know, do well. So knowing the playwrights, like he said, knowing the characters, you know, um, knowing all those details will help you book that job. And I tell this story all the time to the, the kids um, that I worked with, that I think I blew an opportunity uh, to be on Broadway in the Book of Mormon because of my lack of prep preparation. I made it all the way to callbacks. You know, they were interested. They put a, um, a score in my face, uh, hit one note on the piano, sing it. And I didn't know the song. I didn't even know anything about the show. And so I completely blew that opportunity because I was not prepared. I wouldn't have cast you either. Listen, you <laughs> said um, my audition, the, the first audition, the callback was at. <laughs> but that's the key word you said, prepare. Yep. Exactly. Prepare. Exactly. Go yeah, and I don't just prepare. know how to play piano by ear or sing by ear. Hmm. Go yeah, and learn how to read music. Easy. If you have a child in theater, Go get them a voice teacher and so they can start, get them in choir, whatever it is, so they can start to learn to read music. They don't have to be perfect, but they should be able to follow along with those notes on that daggone page. Absolutely. They should be able to dissect a script and uh, talk, you know, a monologue and not just pull a monologue off YouTube, but go and read a script and find a monologue inside the script that you're reading so you know the story that you're talking about when you're performing in the audition. I could go on and on about that. And this is just a side note. I know we're preparing for a show, but um, if you learn how to play certain instrument, instruments, that's like a big thing now, learning how to um, speak different languages, not just to book a show, but I know we reach out to people to play pianos for auditions. Like just being able to make, create work yourself outside of being on the stage is very important because I know when I was in undergrad and it's like oh I'm just gonna be an actor I'm just gonna be an actor no like for me I was like I'm gonna learn how to stage manage I'm gonna learn how to do this and I'm gonna learn French but I'm not always going to be on the stage I know that I want to be around theater 24 7 so I need to know how I you know create those spaces for me to do that Erica, can I just go back to, uh, to uh, Tamika's question for a second? And it's to say, it's to challenge not only the actors, but people in leadership, like at the universities, especially HBCUs. I came from an HBCU from undergrad, and I loved all of the experiences. Go HBCUs, okay? That's not mm -hmm. what this is about, but I just want to throw that in there, put a little plug in there. But my thing is, when those professors are in those uh, positions of power and leadership, that we're not limited to just Black plays. I think it's important to know other plays because we're having this discussion and this panel about wanting space and fighting to get the uh, to get in these spaces and other roles. But when we get there, if we've never been exposed to it, we don't know how to engage with this language, mm -hmm. it is important to learn that while we are in an environment to learn, HBCUs, stop just doing August Wilson. We, we, I think it's important and we should because if nobody else do it, you ought to have the space to do so at your HBCU. But we don't have to do August every season because in the real world, African Americans don't dominate the theater. We don't, I, I, I mean, the, the scripts aren't just endless in all of these regional theaters where it's, it's all black plays. That, that is, 
a beautiful thing. One day we will get there and you will always be able to find, but that ain't today. We need to know all types of scripts. We ought to be able to break down Shakespeare in the same way that we are able to break down August Wilson. We ought to be able to relate to him in the same way. It's no accident that Shakespeare has been able to, to, to make it over this, uh, over this space and time. Some of those plots still reign today. Like it's, we can relate Absolutely. to it whether we black or white or chocolate or yellow or purple because the, the 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 text is just there but we are so scared to do that because i guess part of it is financial situations and you have to to play to what the audiences will come but the other part of that is that it's a learning environment that students are paying to be taught so sometimes we have to sacrifice this show for the for the purpose of teaching for learning, to educate our Black students, uh, to be the best that they can be. Not just as a Black artist, but as an artist in general. We should be able to communicate with anybody. And we can't do that if we only learn one type of theater. Then we get in these spaces where we go off to, to grad schools, to further education, or off into the real world to hit the pavement and try to learn theater. And we clueless. We got you a good August. I will, I will set it off in here with a good black play but what about other spaces other other shows we keep asking people or, or trying to push our way into these spaces to make space for us to be in any kind of show but when we get there we got to show up and show out and we you can't do that if we don't know what we're talking about mm -hmm. you talked about shakespeare and i just want to say something really quickly i was talking to matt wallace who is the amazing artistic director of kentucky shakespeare uh and he does shakespeare behind bars and he was just saying, he's like, you know, people of color here in town just often don't come out to auditions because they think, oh, well, I don't do Shakespeare. And he's like, no, anybody can do Shakespeare. Shakespeare is, is, a, is another text, just like any other text. Yes, there's specific dialect and that kind of thing, but you can learn that along the way. And so I encourage our people even to branch out and don't be afraid to do Shakespeare. It's not as daunting as you might think it is. And I'll, I'll just piggyback on that, uh, Tamika's question. It goes to basic professionalism. You don't go into, I mean, uh, Erica, you're an example. You don't go into an audition not knowing what the, the, the material is. You got to be professional. And then I, I've heard people say, black people say that professionalism between black and, and, and white uh, uh, artists is different. That's, I don't, I don't know what that was prejudice. Like I said, it came out of a black person's mouth, but you got to be professional. Absolutely. Okay, guys, this was awesome. We have gone uh, 30 minutes over our scheduled time. Um, I don't know who came up with the rule for an hour for these panels. I mean, I guess we could change it if we needed to, but I think we can do um, a part two so um, we can discuss maybe coming back uh, at a later date. This was so good. I would encourage you all to go back through and read these comments uh, because they were coming in so rapidly and a lot of people were giving you all shout outs and kudos and having some great dialogue within the chat. So go back, go and check that out and maybe respond um, to the people that um, were talking to you guys directly that we won't be able to share on the live right now. Um, but can we just uh, go around the room really quick in one or two sentences and give your closing thoughts, remarks. Uh, Sujata, you had your uh, she had finger the, She had the Baptist finger. You got the Baptist finger up. <laughs> so I've only been in Louisville for like nine months. And all of you have just confirmed why I love Louisville and why I'm so happy and why I'm here. Aww. So I just want to you know, I've been able to talk to y'all, you know, some of you individually. And it was just, I knew when I first came to Louisville for my apprenticeship, you know, when you walk into a space and you're like, this is home. But y'all have just confirmed it for me. And I love y'all, y'all's work. And I just love you all as individuals. And I can't wait to like be around you. In yeah. Um. But I would say to everyone in the world, um, stay focused, um, continue to believe in yourself, never, 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 never give up. Cause they say, you know, it, it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes time. I am proof. It takes 
time. But if you just keep going on that path, you will make it. Alphias, any last words you want to share? Well, <laughs> as we look back over the conversation we've had over the uh -huh. past 90 minutes or so, I believe it is appropriate that we look at the Apostle Paul oh. and his words in the epistle to the Corinthian church. I'm making all this up as we, I don't know. I thought you was going <laughs> Reverend Chester for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> listen, I, I think in, in terms of a parting thought, I think the biggest thing that I would say is that it is most important that you stay true to yourself and just do your work the best way you can and whatever happens after that is what happens after that is what when none of us have any control over that um all we have control over is the amount of work that we put into what we do and that's it and so i would encourage everybody to just kind of love on themselves enough to be true to who they are and the way they do what they do larry uh i've always just tried to I look at myself like I'm a, I'm a brother out here trying to make a contribution, trying to build a reputation in the theater community as somebody other theater artists would want to work with and build an audience of people who will come and see my shows again and again because we always have something new. Janelle Renee. Um, I would say that know that your voice matters, that we need your voice. Um, we are waiting to hear your voice. Um, and I love black people. We so dope. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Alonzo. Oh, uh, I would just say uh, do the work. Like I said before, don't be afraid to create and to follow your own path that you don't have to always do things the way that you've been told. Um, that we have to do them, think outside the box. Um, and live theater is not dead. So we need to keep our heads high and remember that we still have a lot more to create and I can't wait to do that. I like that, live theater is not dead. Ain't dead. It might be for three days, but it's gonna get up again. <laughs> Where's the organ? Wow, Hey, Sandra. Don't just sit with this anger that we feel or these emotions that we feel, but I charge us to move beyond just being emotional or feeling anger or getting upset, but to use that as fuel to push us to the next level. Find your community. Other people feel the same way as you. Two people are always going to be able to push further along than the one. So if we keep on adding on people with these same feelings, think of how far we can go. I am so excited to be a part of the Louisville Theater community. Yeah. And I can't wait to get started with the work with the rest of you hard hitters. I'm just excited to be in the mix, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you, sister. Rush. Just remember, um, our gifts aren't for us. They're to bless somebody else, and we're the only ones that can make a change. That's it. And it's not only for some changes we might not even see in our lifetime. Some changes would be our kids' kids, but it is our charge to share those gifts, to use those gifts and make each other stronger. And I'll just um, end this by saying, um, never give up on your dreams, no matter how old you are, um, no matter how you know far removed from it you think you are, you think it's no hope for you. Always follow your dreams because I pushed my way into this industry. I don't have any formal education in any of this. I got everything that I know I learned from these people on this panel now, seriously. Um, and I learned on the job and I created a space for myself that just so happened to land me in a leadership position at Actors Theater of Louisville, one of the most prestigious regional theaters in the country. And you so, earned it. <laughs> so just know that your, um, 
that, that your dreams will come true. And to paraphrase Marianne Williamson, who said something like, um, don't uh, be afraid to let your light shine because as you, as you shine your light, you give others permission to do the same. Reach. All right. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Bye.